Good day, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome back for this uh, next session. Um, I'm Andrew Ross. I uh, was a little late getting here. I'm the chair of, of this meeting, although I've been somewhat absentee for, for reasons. I first want to say thank you very much for coming. I really appreciate it. I hope everybody's enjoying this. It's fantastic for the association to have boots back on the ground. And I put a plug in that keep an eye open. We're going to be back again next year. Next year, we'll be in the beautiful capital of Ottawa. Uh, fall dates, we don't have quite locked down yet. We're still trying to get ourselves back in uh back in a rhythm of, of annual annual in-person meetings. I think it's, uh, I've heard nothing but accolades from people to be be able to be back here and, and, and meeting people and, and seeing people. Uh, one of the things that has evolved over the last three years since the last time we met is this whole idea of a hybrid meeting with uh, virtual. I think it's fantastic because we were able to bring a really, really uh, interesting group of, uh, of speakers that wouldn't otherwise necessarily be able to be there. And this particular session kind of capitalizes on that. Um, this is a session that again, as we've tried to do this meeting over the last three years has kind of evolved. We always wanted to have a session on COVID uh, and COVID's impacts on nuclear medicine uh, around the world to get a world perspective on that. I think at this point, we're kind of, as we are moving into that living with COVID uh, timeframe, it's even more uh, apropos. And so we have a couple of speakers. Um, they come to us from the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Association. Um, there's a picture of that uh, Astaire uh, uh, organization's headquarters in Vienna. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. Um, I, I don't know if if I'm telling, probably everybody here knows the IAEA. I certainly didn't until I became involved with them a, a few years ago, but it is uh, their, their moniker is Atoms for Peace. Um, they are the guys who do the nuclear medicine or the the uh, nuclear bomb uh, inspections in places like Iran, but they also have a very very uh, dedicated and uh, an important health uh, health sciences section. And the the people here today are from that that group from the uh, from the um, uh, health sciences and from the nuclear medicine uh, subsection of that. I've had the honor and opportunity to meet both these wonderful people over the years. They are fantastic. I'm going to introduce both of them together because I gather they're going to act like a tag team from Vienna. Uh, so I'm going to let them coordinate themselves uh, as we move forward. Uh, for now, though, I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Diana Piez, uh, the head of the nuclear medicine and diagnostic imaging section at the health, uh, human health division of the Department of Nuclear Sciences and Applications at the IAEA. Um, Diana has been there for quite a few years. It doesn't say in your bio how long, but I, you've been there for as long as I've been there. So that's that's I'm getting old. Um, she uh, came to the IAEA from Columbia. Uh, she did her training in nuclear medicine there, but then did fellowships in nuclear cardiology as well as uh, nuclear oncology in New York at St. Luke's Roosevelt and at Memorial Sloan Kittering, very highly trained. And she's been a very uh, passionate uh, individual in pushing clinical nuclear medicine from the IAEA. The IAEA is a, has 174 member states. It's a, a division of the UN. Uh, it brings together developing and pushes for, for equity within developing countries, trying to uh, help expand and nuclear medicine there, uh, but it also offers a very, very important service to the developed countries such as Canada, who are members as well because we get to interact and their their educational stuff is phenomenal. So Diana is going to be speaking to us on, on her side. And then we also have Dr. Francesco Giamaldi, who I met many years ago. Uh, he is the senior technical officer for the IAEA for the Department of Nuclear Medicine. Um, he actually came out of, the first time I met him, he was still practicing in France. He was the professor um, and senior lecturer at the University Hospital in Lyon, and he's been with the IAEA, I think, at least five years now, but I've, I've, I've lost track. So, um, And with that, I'm going to turn it over our, to our two illustrious guests in Vienna, I, and we'll, uh, we'll entertain questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ross, for the nice introduction. It is a pleasure for me and for Francesco to be here representing the International Atomic Energy Agency. As you mentioned, we are taking advantage of the both words, the virtual and the in-person. Uh, I personally consider that the in-person meetings can never be replaced, but technology definitely has facilitated our lives. Uh, so in the in the next few minutes, I have nothing to disclose. Uh, we, Francesco and I, we will talk about the what the agency has been doing in order to in order to support the uh, international community to tackle the burden of COVID-19. 
We will focus initially on the activities implemented by the International Atomic Energy Agency and in particular the nuclear medicine and diagnostic imaging section. And then we will present a couple of studies that were published by us or led by us. One is devoted to the impact of COVID-19 in the nuclear medicine services. And the second one is devoted to the impact of COVID-19 in the diagnosis of heart diseases, which includes a myriad of, of modalities. Before starting, please briefly allow me to explain what the IAEA is. Dr. Ross already mentioned that the IAEA is part of the United Nations family. So we are an independent intergovernmental science and technology-based organization. And we are a member of the United Nations family, as I mentioned before. We serve as a global focal point for nuclear cooperation uh, worldwide. At present, we have 175 member states. Actually, we have our general conference ending yesterday, and we have two new member states since uh, Friday. And we work with these member states and several partners worldwide to promote the safe, secure, and peaceful use of nuclear technology. Our mission is to accelerate, accelerate and enlarge the contribution of atomic energy to peace, to health, and to prosperity throughout the world, always guided by the interests and the needs of the member states. The agency has three main pillars or areas of cooperation. The one that perhaps you have heard about, especially lately, is the safeguards and verifications under which the agency verifies that the member states comply with their commitments under the non-proliferation treaty and other non-proliferation agreements to use the nuclear materials and facilities only for peaceful purposes. The second one that is also extremely important is the uh, safety and security under which what we do is to develop nuclear safety standards and promote high levels of safety as well as the protection of the human health, the environment, and the, uh, against the ionizing uh, radiation. The third area, which is the one that Dr. Ross was referring to, is the nuclear sciences and applications. It's the nice phase of the agency. What we do is to assist the member states to meet their development needs through the nuclear science and technology applications and innovations. We cover a broad range of socioeconomic sectors from health, food and agriculture, environment, water resources, and industry. And we also support the generation of uh, electricity. As part of these uh, nuclear sciences and applications, we have the program of human health. So within our commitment in transferring nuclear technologies for peaceful purposes, our role in the division of human health is to strengthen the capabilities of member states to address the needs related to the prevention, the diagnosis, and the treatment of health problems through the applications of, of the different nuclear and related techniques. And in the particular case of the nuclear medicine and diagnostic imaging section, which is the section where Francesco and I work, the focus is on providing comprehensive support to establish or strengthen the practice of these medical fields in a context of appropriate use, safe, and quality of a clinical practice. And to achieve this, we provide support in all phases or stages of implementation of nuclear medicine always considering the particular needs of the country, the institutions, or the professionals to be supported. We go from advising on when a nuclear medicine department or radiology department, a new radiology modality, a new application is needed throughout the entire spectrum, the planning and setting up, the continuous professional development, the appropriate use criteria, the adherence to international safety standards, both for radiation protection and radiopharmacy, the implementation of quality management systems, and, and uh, last but not least, the application of uh, implementation of applied clinical research. We encourage our colleagues from low and middle income countries to be part of this well conducted uh, research implemented by the agency. Well, we are here to talk about COVID. So let's talk about COVID and what the agency has been doing. 
Since the beginning of the pandemic, the, the nuclear medicine and diagnostic imaging section has mobilized immediately to support the member, the nuclear medicine community so that they can uh, continue to provide the essential services while protecting the patients, the staff, and the public from the infection. For example, we ran a series of three webinars, the first of which was broadcast on March 25, 2020, just 10 days after the lockdown, lockdown in, in Europe. And that one was aiming at addressing the challenges posed by the pandemic. We had uh, experts from all the regions and we, we were trying to understand the magnitude of the problem in the departments. Then on 16 April, like one month after the previous one, we have the second webinar presenting how the SOP should be adapted in order to continue working by while reducing the risk. Uh, each webinar was uh, had over 10,000 viewers, and then they were available in our website. We are still having visitors to these webinars. The third webinar was on May 13, and this one was more focused on how to go to reopen, how to go to the transition to, to the transition of the so-called quote unquote new normal, meaning learning to live with the virus which is something that we are doing on a daily basis. In addition to that, the IAEA also, uh, we are a procurement agency. So we buy technology for the member states. In the context of COVID-19 and responding to the request from the member states, we immediately deployed all of our resources and in cooperation with WHO, we sent a series of uh, RT-PCR equipment, reagents, consumables, safety cabinets, and personal protective equipment to 287 laboratories in 128 member states. And we also deliver some 26 portable X-ray machines to an equal number of, of uh, countries. We were in a lockdown. We were sending equipment with our, without being able to train people. So. To, to overcome this difficulty, we develop a series of uh, videos, our section, the nuclear medicine section, in cooperation with colleagues from molecular biology. We develop videos on the how to perform the RT-PCR and the serology for COVID. They were available in English, Spanish, Russian, French, uh, Portuguese. And then we also conducted a series of 24 webinars, the same thing, RT-PCR, serology, in cooperation with the WHO, also in English, Spanish, Russian, French, and this time we added the Arabic. We were extremely active and with an amazing team of international experts, we were able to publish some 20 uh, articles in high impact peer review journals, going from the uh, JAC, the Journal of American College of Cardiology, the Journal of Nuclear Medicine, the European Journal of Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Imaging, Open Heart, Circulation. So we will present a couple of these. We are very proud to mention that the first publication that was made available by the IAEA group was in April 2020. We started the, lo the lockdown in March. In April, we were already publishing after the second webinar, a series of recommendations to adjust the SOPs. And it's very nice. I will really recommend you to go through this. Uh, this is an editorial actually, but it has a step by a step, how to adjust. And this is applicable to any condition, not only to COVID. Then in May, we published the second one, and it was with the, uh, this color coded on how to reopen the, the facilities. This is the series of uh, information included in the first article, and we included elements related to governance, resources, services, patient flow, supplies, staff. Very interesting paper, and again, I recommend you to, to take a look of this one. And was, this actually was one of the most popular articles in the EGNM in 2020. Then we published the second one, also related to the third webinar, that is how to 
gradually open the nuclear medicine departments. And this is something that continues very valid because we know that the pandemic can go from one transition phase to another one. So we could have no transmission between humans and go to the next phase again to the transmission. So we have the three, uh, the color coded phases, the red phase, the amber phase, and the uh, green phase to support colleagues to reopen or to maintain the facilities. Cardiology to us is extremely important. It's the second cause of mortality worldwide. So we were working with our partner organizations, the American Society of Nuclear Cardiology, the Society of Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Imaging, to publish these uh, guidance and best practices for the reestablishment of a non-emerging care in nuclear cardiology laboratories. This publication was also endorsed by the Infectious Diseases Society of North America. It has similar to the previous one, this color coded, but this is the, the stratification by phases. What is the urgent patients, the higher priority, the lower priority, and the elective? This publication uh, has been reviewed and updated, and the, the second series will be published shortly. Very proud to announce that Francesco here with me, he led this internal publication. It's a complete document devoted to provide technical guidance on how to operate during the COVID-19. It was released in July. Again, we had the lockdown in April. Usually, the publication of this type of document takes one, two years in our time, in the IAEA time. This was in few months. It was a tremendous effort. Francesco, now over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Diana. And thank you also to Dr. Ross who, uh, with this nice introduction. So I, I have um, nothing to disclose. I hope that uh, my slides are visible now. No, not yet. Uh, let me see. Yes, yes, okay. yes. Okay, so nothing, nothing to disclose. Uh, yes. Now, the, uh, the aim of my presentation, uh, as said before by Diana, is to analyze the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic worldwide in nuclear medicine practice. And how we did, we did uh, several surveys. The first was conducted in April 20. Uh, and then we had two follow-up surveys uh, at two specific time points, one in June and the other in October, always in 2020. Uh, the idea was to describe the possible implication in the present and the, in the future, and to measure the implication of the prolonged lockdown over the nuclear medicine departments. We also looked at changes that should be continued after life returns to normalcy, as was illustrated uh, by Diana previously. So the, uh, the first uh, paper was published in uh, um, September 2020, about the survey conducted in 2020, April, we had 434 centers from 73 countries, and uh, the data were collected from. Sorry, I have from from April to May 2020. So according to this survey, the general nuclear medicine pr procedure, so the diagnostic procedure aspect, were decreased by 54%. Uh, and the, pr the procedure with the greatest impact were thyroid scan, 67%, followed by cardiac with 66, bone with 60, and lung studies with 56%. The sentinel node procedures decreased by 45%, and PET studies ha have a 36% only decrease. This is because of uh, more urgent, probably, uh, exams. If you look at the, uh, the impact worldwide, we can see that the, this decrease in nuclear medicine procedure is not uniform. Uh, if you look at low and middle impact count, uh, countries, and in particular, the, the main 
decrease was in Latin America, while in Europe and North America, the impact was lower. Now, also radionuclide therapies were uh, decreased. In particular, we had uh, an average decrease of 46% with benign thyroid study with the greatest impact. This is evident because of the less importance of the urgency of this procedure, 63%, malignant 47%, selective internal radiotherapy 40%, radiosinovectomy 43%, and uh, prostate with PSMA lutetium uh, treatment 38%. Uh, if you look in uh, particular in uh, among countries, the main impact was in Pakistan, India, South Africa, and Colombia, while less impacted were the European country and US. Uh, now we also were looking at the problem in supply of key material, uh, of course. COVID impacted also the transport of uh, generator and the production of generator. And 46% uh, of the center did not have an adequate supply in technician generator, 47 of higher than 131. Regarding the therapies, lutetium and samarium supplies were insufficient in 48 and 50% respectively. And uh, only 21% of the center report a shortage of gallium and FTG, probably because of local production. Once again, the Latin American center have the greatest impact, particularly in uh, the availability of 131 iodine and technetium generator. Uh, by the way, in those countries, uh, FDG was, uh, availability was higher than 80% that showing that the, the activity was switched in PET that was uh, re, re, um, related to the fact that FDG was produced locally. If you look at um, the uh, uh, order of technetium generator, so in this case we, we look at the uh, diminution of the patient flow, uh, over 60% of the participating center reduced the order of the technetium generator during the pandemic phase. And uh, uh, in, uh, if, we, if we look at uh, the uh, insufficient supply of key materials on different continents, we see that Europe has less suffered, while Latin America, Africa, Asia, and Oceania were the most impacted. Now we move to the second, oh, I'm really sorry, <laughs> the second uh, survey that was conducted in, uh, I don't know what happened, I have a problem in my, yes, the second survey that, that was uh, conducted in uh, June and October and published in December 2021, so June, October 2020. Here we were looking at the um, situation after the first crisis, COVID crisis, but still during the pandemic. And we see that uh, the decreased PET diagnostic procedure were 65% in June and 40% in October. So the, the highest impact of COVID, according to our survey, was in June 2020. Looking at uh, the countries, uh, the sorry, this was pet. This is uh, nuclear medicine. 73 in June and 57 in October. Sorry. Uh, um, essentially, thyroid, cardiac, bone, and lung were the most impacted. And looking at the countries, the greatest impact was seen in the Americas in June and in the Eastern European countries in October. So this was, was PET, uh, PET, I already said. Uh, so the decrease was mainly in Latin America and Southeast 
Asian countries. And for therapy, uh, June 69% and October 48%. Uh, compared to the activity pre-COVID-19. Uh, the uh, therapy decreased particularly in low and middle income countries. I don't know, I can't change in a proper way. Uh, if you look at the overall decrease, uh, comparing the survey in April and the survey in June and in October, we can say that the, the volume on nuclear medicine procedure globally decreased by 73.9% in June and 57% in October. Packed activity decreased by 65% in June and 40% in October. And radionuclide therapy decreased by 69% in June and 48 in October. What is very important to notice in this uh, slide is that the total number of procedure remained below those recorded in April 2020. So in October, we had a partial return to normal, but never as uh, good as was, was what was recorded in April. Now, uh, if you look at the changes in the go, uh, in uh, decreased supplies, we, we looked that in uh, June and in October, we have insufficient supplies of radioisotope generators and kits, uh, mainly for iron-131 and technetium generator. Uh, this reduction uh, varied significantly between the region and was more frequently reported from Africa, Asia, Oceania, and Latin America. Thank you. Thank you very much for your attention. Sorry for this problem, technical problem on advancing slides. Thank you. Over to you, Diana. Thank you so much, Francesco. So let me continue with the second survey. I don't know, can you see my screen right now? Okay. So Francesco just presented the surveys that we conducted evaluating the impact in the nuclear medicine services, diagnostic and therapeutic components. We had a couple of additional surveys, but those were devoted to the impact of COVID-19 in the diagnosis of heart disease. It was conducted by the uh, Nuclear Medicine and Diagnostic Imaging Section with a large group of uh, colleagues, in particular from the uh, US. The, the lead author was Dr. Andrew Einstein, and it was published in January 2021 in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology. We evaluated the impact in all diagnostic procedures from the simple electrocardiogram to the cardiac MRI. Over 900 uh, centers from 108 countries reported an average reduction of 64% in the cardi cardiologic uh, procedures as a whole. That was in March 2020 just one month after the lockdown. And this was in comparison with the same month in the previous year. So what we did is we told them, kindly let us know how many studies were performed in March 2019 and in March 2020. Over 700,000 diagnostic procedures were not performed. And we are talking about the diagnosis of heart conditions. So we were really having a huge problem. One analyzing by type of procedure, the stress tests, including SPECT and PECT, were reduced by 78%. The transesophageal echo, 76%, and transthoracic echo by 59%. Let's take a look at the stress modalities. Mentioned before, the stress moralities as a whole, they reduced by 78 in, in March and recovered a little bit, but continue below the average in April 2022. But when we go and evaluate the independent moralities, I just want to point it out these two things. Look at this. Expect studies, they went, the decline was 76% and in, in April, they continue 42% below. The PET, the decline was 58 and continue 36%, which is very much in, in agreement 
through the data that was presented by Francesco. The SPECT studies were affected most than the PET studies, and in the case of cardiac, more than any other cardiac stress modality. The reason behind that, most probably the supply of the generators that was disrupted, and in addition, the, the type of study, the, just the fact to performing a stress study uh, when we have a virus that was transmitted airborne. So when we go and evaluate the status or the situation, uh, according to the World Bank income status, what we notice is that all, this, all the, the uh, different income status were affected at similar level, high, upper middle, lower middle, and low. Francesco presented that in the case of the nuclear medicine procedures, Latin America was the, the most affected. In this case, it was North America because perhaps the highest number of nuclear cardiology studies performed there, followed by Europe and then Latin America, which is very interesting data. So one year after that, we say, okay, let's see what's going on with the studies. Let's conduct a different survey, a second survey. And we did so with the same group of experts, including a all the regions, and the aim of this study was to determine the impact of the pandemic on the cardiac, te uh, cardiac testing practices, volumes, and types of the diagnostic services, and perceive, in addition to the previous one, we wanted to evaluate the psychological stress of the healthcare providers. In this particular case, the survey analyzed the data of the studies performed in April uh, 2021. This is the, the first study where we compared 2019 with March and April 2020. The second study that has 669 centers from 107 countries, 67% of which participated in the, in the first study were analyzed and we evaluated April 2021. So let's compare April 2020 versus April 2021, one year after. Look at this data here. We have in the uh, top of the screen, all stress modalities that were reduced by 77% in April 2020. They continue 12% below the, the baseline that was 2019 in April 2021. But look, some of the modalities recover CCTA, calcium scoring, transit of object echo, cardiac MRI, a PET for, for infection, but look what happened with the stress modalities. Most probably because of the same reason, because of the airborne, the, the center were more reluctant to perform the studies. So in this particular case, the stress electrocardiogram remains 17% below. A stress, a stress a expect 16%. Those are the two most affected. In here, we have a stress nuclear, which is basically the combination of PET and SPET. But if we isolate a stress PET and a stress CMR, they not only recover, they went 25% above. So most probably these studies, these patients went from a stress SPET or a stress EKG to a stress PET or a stress cardiac magnetic resonance. By regions, the uh, line, the column in, in, I think it's como, it's like, like gray or dark gray, is March 2019, blue is April 2020, and the orange is April 2021. In all the regions, we see the, the trend to the recovery in all of them. And this is the, the global average. By country, as I mentioned, we have 106 countries, and this is by income status. Again, the low, lower middle, upper middle, and high income countries, they will, they really recover more or less at the same pace, but we have a problem. There are some regions and some areas that were lagging behind. So the recovery in Latin America and Asia Pacific was not as good as what we saw in other regions. Let's take the example of Europe. Again, March 2019, April 2020, April 2021. In the Eastern 
region of Europe, in March 2020, we had a decline of 81%. In April 2021, was still 69% for all modalities. In Southern Europe, the same thing, 71 and 61, while in the, in the most uh, developed and high income countries, they have a, a important recovery for all the modalities, the same for the stress modalities. Let's see different stress modalities. This is a particular case. In, it's, it's interesting to see, you see this in here, the, the pet is the one that is in green. Eastern, Northern and Southern Europe expect the studies remain below. The only one that was really recovered was with Western Europe. Why is this? We think that is perhaps the supply of, of the molybdenum technetium generators. Those are things that we really need to, to further analyze. For the case of the PET CT, in, in most of the regions, it was recovered with the exception of the Southern uh, Europe. A stress MR, it went really up in the Northern Europe. And a stress echo improved in the areas where the other modalities were really continued behind the, the trend of the recovery. As for the psychological impact, it was very evident that both physicians and non-physicians, they have a perception of extremely high post-traumatic stress uh, due to the COVID-19. Uh, so many uncertainties about family, about the, their own job, uh, those with private centers that some of them really have to close the facilities. So, the COVID-19 pandemic initially reduced the diagnostic testing for heart diseases, and one year after the, the first wave of the pandemic, the situation has not improved in the lower income countries, continues being very bad. A high level of psychological stress among practitioners that could be attributable to the pandemic has had a negative impact in the restoration of the diagnostic centers. This is interesting because for those centers that reported the highest uh, perception of stress, they were the ones that were not able to recover. And then efforts are needed to mitigate the deleterious effects of the pandemic on the psychological wellness of physicians and other caregivers, and to ensure the timely access to diagnostic cardiac testing, especially in lower income countries. As a conclusion for both presentations, Francesco and myself, COVID-19 definitely disrupted the life, all aspects of our lives. Nuclear medicine and diagnostic heart uh, disease uh, tests were not the exception. General nuclear medicine was more affected than the PET and the therapies, most probably because of the availability of PET in the centers. There were disparities in the recovery, looking at the, some regions like Latin America and the low-income countries having the, the highest impact that has persisted over the time. And there is a need to be prepared and to adapt our standard operating procedures for the future, uh, hopefully no more pandemics, but we don't know. We are still going through the Omicron B5 and I don't know how many more are, are coming. So once again, we would like to thank uh, Dr. Ross, the CANM, the organizing committee for inviting us to be part of this presentation. And with this, we thank, thank you so much. Well, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Diana and Francesco. Um, uh, I offer the opportunity. Does anybody uh, have any questions or comments they'd like to make to our distinguished visitors here virtually at this point? Questions on things? I think it was a very thorough. One, I, I, one thing I sort of uh, was, you, you, you touched on it there, talking about, uh, you know, the, uh, the personal uh, effects of, of this on, on private people. One of the things that we're faced here in, in, in Canada, and I just wanted whether you uh, had any uh, thoughts or, 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 or ideas about other jurisdictions. Um, this has had a tremendous, is really accentuated, um, you know, a human resource um, uh, uh, um, 
deficit that we have. Uh, we have many departments with, the, 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 be it the COVID or the, the baby boom, I think it really accentuated early retirements. People got fed up with working in, in, in these departments and, and left. And so one of the biggest detriments that we face at this point is that in terms of being a, being able to reestablish um, our uh, our uh, case loads again. And I wonder, did, have you seen or been told about that? Is that kind of a, would you consider that more of a, a world thing as opposed to just, just what we're facing? I, I see if Francesco I is, yes, please. I can, I can answer because uh, in, indeed, uh, the, uh, um, some slides were not presented for for the sake of time, and uh, uh, for the survey we had also questions regarding the the staff, and uh, in particular the uh, the number of cases were practically uh, in in October 2020 uh, nearly three quarter of uh, of staff uh, in nuclear medicine had uh, have had uh, COVID October 2020. So yeah. It's terrible, and and clearly uh, also there was a deficit of on staff uh, due to the fact that many uh, professional health professionals were involved in other more critical um, sector of the hospital, uh, so they were displaced in in uh, in several. So so this is this is the reason why uh, also the the activity were shortened and and why the the number the number of generator requests were also diminished mm -hmm. thank you thank you for your question thank I you i don't know and if, if you want if, to add something yes please if if i may add um one of the of the things that we evaluated were the the changes in the standard operating procedures so most of the centers they they have either the employees were shifted to another areas where there were some uh, priority needs. The other thing is that due to the the restrictions to diminish the exposure, we started to do the teleworking. So the teleradiology increased tremendously for education, for research. They they were, I suppose, in Canada was the same. The, the activities. Uh, were shifted to the virtual thing. But for the people going to the facilities, to the hospitals, the technology is going, or the physician in charge, in the evaluation of the perceived uh, stress, they, they were under a much higher stress than those that were at home. And this is only reasonable. I mean, they, in addition to, to being scared for, for themselves, they were scared for the families. And it was something that happened in all the regions in the world everywhere even when the number of, of covid cases were not really high yeah yes uh, i don't i don't think we've seen and we've still got uh, a lot of adjustments and 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 things moving forward as we move into the era that they affectionately refer to as living with covid i mean it's still we we just never know when another another bomb is going to hit i guess so to speak um these guys have done a fantastic job of summarizing this thing. They've actually potentially given us extra time for lunch and a little bit more social time, which I think is wonderful. And it gets them, I guess it's getting on for supper time there. So it gets to you to, to the dinner bell at a reasonable time. Any any comments or any further things before I, I sign off on, 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 on Vienna? I do really, really appreciate that uh, that you took the times out of your schedules to come be with us. I hope we can in, uh, impose on you again at a future date because the IAEA brings a very important uh, perspective uh, to to a meeting such as ours, and it's it's great that you take the time to share it with us. I thank you, um, and I look forward to seeing and working with you again, and the CANM working with you, of course, as we have in the past and will continue to. I want to thank everyone for uh, your your time.